Will you give a warm New Hope welcome as Pastor Manny Arango comes to bring the word to us this morning? Anybody sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in the room? Come on, is it just me? Man, the presence of the Lord is here. And uh, I'm really, really excited. I'm, it's an honor. It's a massive honor uh, to be able to be a part of Spiritual Emphasis Week. And uh, I think that any pastors, any leaders who would set aside time in the year for this um, obviously care about you a whole lot. And so uh, how many people know it's a really, really amazing thing to have pastors that are full of integrity, full of character, um, who care about their sheep. And uh, so come on, can we give it up for the pastors in the room? Come on, I see Pastor Weaver in the back. Obviously, Pastor Jeff and your whole family, I love you guys. I've met a ton of associate pastors, the worship team. You guys are amazing. So um, there's a lot of churches who um, don't carve out time to, to do this, to, to emphasize your spirituality and your spiritual growth. And so um, I don't take it lightly, and I'm super, super excited. And so um, come on, let's get into the Word. Who's excited for the Word tonight? Come on, I'm excited. You can grab a Bible. Come on, if you got a physical Bible, go ahead and grab it. And uh, if you were here this morning, then you already know where we're going. We're going right back to Genesis chapter 29. And this is part two uh, of the same uh, message. Uh, I, I, I have a different title, but I'll announce the title for this. Uh, at, uh, when I get to the title part. So come on, let's talk about seed. Come on, we're going to pick up right where we left off. This morning I said there were how many types of seed? Five. Five kinds of seed that everybody has. Come on, so let's pick up with number four. Number four, number four. Who's ready? Yeah. Come on, you ready to jump right in, yeah? yeah. Come on, number four, number four. Uh, first of all, let's do a little recap. Who remembers number one? First kind of seed everybody has is? Good. Second kind of seed everybody has is? Good. Third kind of seed everybody has is? yourself. Number four, time. 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 You and Beyonce have the same amount of time. <laughs> okay, everyone has the same amount of time. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, Barna released a report, uh, Pastor Jeff, that said 96% uh, of Christians have never read the entire Bible cover to cover. 96% of Christians have never read the entire Bible cover to cover, which means about, if for all the mathematicians in the room, about 4% of Christians have read the whole Bible cover to cover. Um, and does anybody know, come on, how long it takes per day to read the entire Bible in a year? It takes 12 minutes. 12 minutes of your day. You know, it's sometimes we complain. Come on, whoever complains, I don't have time. Well, guess what? We got time for Netflix. We got time for Hulu. We got time for Paramount+. Plus. Got time for YouTube, got time for TikTok, got time for Instagram, got time for all kinds of things. But your time is a seed. And you are not just a product of what you think about. You're not just a product of what you focus on. You're a product of what? The time that you invest. I want to teach you four laws. Four laws, okay? You can write these down. Four laws of sowing and reaping. Four laws of sowing and reaping. Number one. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Okay? That's the easiest one. The next three, they progressively get harder, right? You reap, come on, what you sow. Which means if I'm harvesting a bunch of anxiety in my life, I have to ask, what kind of anxiety seed got sown? Who sowed it? How did it get sown? Because it didn't just pop up out of nowhere. You reap, come on, what you sow. Here's the next one. Here's the next one. You ready? You reap where you sow. You don't just reap what you sow. You reap where you sow. Okay? So if you sow, uh, husband, dad, if all you do is sow into your job in video games, you can't be surprised when you're not reaping from your family. Because you reap where you sow. This is why whenever Christians, you know, argue with me about, you know, where they should tithe. I got to, not here, y'all are perfect, but back at my home church, you know, uh, back in North Carolina, before I moved to Texas, you know, we'd have people from, you know, some country towns, little towns, and I'd ask them, like, hey, you've been attending our church for a long time, you know, are you tithing? And they'd say, oh, I tithe back at my home church. And I said, well, that's a lot like working at Burger King and getting a paycheck from McDonald's. 
No, you reap where you sow. So if you're going to reap from that church, then that's where you should sow. But you don't live there. But they need it more than this church. This is a big church. Well, well, here's some good news for you. Uh, the tithe belongs to God. You don't get to dictate what church needs it more. Because it's not your money. God just lets you hold on to it, trusting that you're going to what? Return it back to him. We don't give the tithe. We give an offering. We pay our tithe. I pay the electric company because I owe them. <laughs> I don't give the tithe. I pay it. Come on. So number one, come on, you reap what you sow. You reap where you sow. So you have to start asking, where am I sowing the majority of my time? Where do I sow the majority of my time? Do I want to reap from Netflix? Then I maybe want to start, stop sowing so much into that. If that's not where I want to reap. Where? Number three, come on. I reap more than I sow. Come on. I reap more than I sow. I always reap more than I sow. The seed is always smaller than the abundance of the harvest that comes in. And then number four, I reap after I sow. That there's a time gap in between the time of sowing and the time of reaping. Time. Can I ask you a question today? Like, if you're a Christian in the room, I think a good decision that you could make is that, hey, if it only takes 12 minutes to read my whole Bible in a calendar year, I'm going to make the decision that I'm going to at least read my Bible once a year. And for most Christians, come on, Barna's not making these numbers up. Most Christians have never read it. Come on, you know how it goes. You start in Genesis, and that's fun. You get like halfway through Exodus and you hit Leviticus and you're like, uh-uh. <laughs> hey, find a Bible plan that works for you. Read the whole Bible. Because if you want to sow your time into spiritual things, then you are going to reap what? You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap more than you sow. You're going to reap after you sow. But you're going to reap where you sow. Time. Time. Number five. Fifth seed. Fifth seed. This is actually my favorite. Money. Finances. Finances. This is my favorite. Uh, it, it's, it's quite funny. Uh, my father uh, was addicted to drugs for most of my life. And then uh, he, got, he came to an altar call. One time I was preaching. I was about 19 years old. And he said the sinner's prayer. Uh, not a lot of fruit of discipleship came out of his life. But, hey, he said the sinner's prayer. I was really happy. And then he just started attending church. And the first thing that he, you know, fussed about was, ah, I don't like that they take offerings. I don't like that. And I went, whoa, 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 hold up a minute. I was like, you smoke two packs of cigarettes like every couple of days. You never mad that Winston takes your money. You drink alcohol. You're not mad that they take your money. You and my mom go to the club every week on Friday nights as a cover charge. You never complain about them taking your money. And the crack dealer in our neighborhood has taken all of your money. And you've never complained about the crack dealer in the neighborhood taking the money. And I remember my dad saying, yeah, the, the pastor left in a Mercedes. And I said, the crack dealer has a Mercedes too. I don't see you all up in arms about the drug dealer that has taken the college tuition that I could have had. I was like, whoa, how about you just, how about, you know there's a sin tax. Not sin tax. <laughs> a tax on sin. Can I be honest? Sin is expensive. I was like, hey, hey, if you actually gave your life to the Lord, you'd stop drinking, you'd stop smoking, you'd stop dealing, you'd stop with the drugs, you'd stop having to get clothes uh, every Friday night because you got to go out to the new club. You, you know how much money you'd save just being saved? <laughs> and you have the nerve to say, I can't believe they want my money. No, they don't want your money. They want you to have life, man. Life. Because the enemy has convinced you that all this stuff that doesn't matter, all the idols of life, all this frivolous living, the enemy has convinced you that gold chains and jewelry and all the things that moth and rust will eat away is going to save you. And I'm telling you, not that the church wants your money, I'm telling you to store up for yourself treasures in heaven. 
It's not about money. <laughs> it's crazy how he, you, you, he never went at the, he never waited for the club to shut down to see if the club owner had a Mercedes. He never, he never like went to the department store to see if the manager at the department store who he opened credit cards up for to get new clothes if they had a Mercedes. Oh, but he cared about whether or not the pastor had a Mercedes. He said, you hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You owe God. Are you kidding me? You, could, you should have overdosed years ago, man. You owe God. You spent years in prison. My, my father took me to a crack house when I was five years old, but I started preaching at 13. I said, you didn't even teach me the Bible. God rescued your son. You owe the Lord. How dare you be angry that tithing is a principle that we emphasize? How dare you be angry? The enemy's blinded you. Okay, come on. Can we keep talking? Can we keep talking? Come on. There's a verse that I want to highlight for you. Two verses, actually. Two verses. So I think New Hope, number one, I believe that this church is generous. Number two, we're going to be even more generous. We want to give to the work of the kingdom of God. We want to support missionaries around the world. Come on, we want to not just build this new facility. We want to build tons of facilities. Come on, we want to be the most generous church. Come on, I need some amens right there. Come on. Come on, I, I, you're going to give me uh, Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 55. There we go. And you're going to help me read this, okay? As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bu bud and that it yields what? Seed. It yields what? Seed, seed for the who? Sower. For the sower. Seed for who? Sower. sower. And what? What? There's another category. And bread for the who? Eater. Eater. So God distinguishes two categories. God's like, hey, I give seed to people who? Sow. So. And I give bread to people who? Which means if I eat everything, God puts me on the bread plan. I get placed on the bread plan. And if I sow, God puts me on the seed plan. I am the one that dictates whether or not I get stuck in the bread line, which I call God's welfare system. Because God's a good father. He's going to meet your needs. He's a good father. Even if you eat everything, God's like, all right, you need daily bread, you need bread, you need sustenance, I'll, I'll bless you just because I'm good. But God would rather you be on the seed plan. Now, now I, this, this same idea finds its way into the New Testament. You can give me Corinthians, um, I'm pretty sure it's 1 Corinthians, yeah, oh, 2 Corinthians, there we go. Now, he who supplies, come on, seed for the who? And what? Bread for food. Bread for food, two different categories. Old Testament, New Testament, speaking in, in concert with one another. That God gives seed to what group of people? And bread to what group of people? Eaters. Imagine, uh, Pastor Zach, you came to my house, and the best fruit is mango. Now, I thought I'd get more amens there. No? Okay, okay. You guys don't like mangoes. All right. Mangoes are amazing, okay? I don't know what your favorite, what's your favorite fruit? Peaches. All right, so... You know, I'm a good friend, so I've got mangoes and peaches so that the both of us can just, like, enjoy, you know, fruit. And imagine, you know, I'm, I'm slicing this mango. I'm slicing up mangoes. We've got peaches. Man, we're having a good time enjoying fruit. And then, you know, I get down to the pit of the mango, and imagine I go to my drawer, and I bust out a steak knife and a fork, and I start cutting up the seed, and I start eating the seed. You would look at me like I'm a crazy person. Because we all know this, that seed does not belong in our stomachs, but seed only belongs in the soil. But how often has the 10% ended up in your stomach instead of God's soil? The part of the, the, your finances that are holy, set apart, but Starbucks got God's money. Uh-oh. All the millennials in the room who complain like, I don't have enough money. No, you do. Here's, here's a trick. Stop buying groceries and eating out. <laughs> Just stop it. Just don't do that. <laughs> if you were to stop doing that, guess what you'd have? You'd have money to actually be generous. 
if I start consuming everything that comes into my life, then God looks at me and says, okay, bread for you. You want to consume more than you want to contribute. So God puts me on the bread plan. Now, here we go. I, I want to tell you a story uh, because uh, in January of 2020, I made a decision, Pastor Weaver, to become a full-time itinerant evangelist. Okay? In 2019, we had done a ton of speaking engagements, and I had to make a decision, you know, am I going to continue to try to balance local church ministry, uh, or am I going to launch in faith and forsake my direct deposit? Whew. A direct deposit's a blessing. And in December of 2019, that was the last time me and my wife got a direct deposit from, from our church. And we launched out in faith to launch Manny Arango Ministries, and we just believed God is going to provide speaking engagements and speaking opportunities so that I could pay my mortgage. Because, you know, I got a wife and a mortgage. <laughs> Important. January of 2020, oh, it was amazing. Lots of speaking engagements. The Lord provided. We paid the mortgage. Come on, praise God. February of 2020, lots of speaking engagements. Uh, oh, it was amazing. Oh, and guess what? We paid the mortgage. March of 2020. Well, the first 15 days were amazing. <laughs> lots of speaking engagements for the first half of the month. And then Tom Hanks got COVID-19. <laughs> Disney shut down, the NBA shut down, woo, and we dipped into our savings account to, come on, pay the mortgage, and then April rolled around, we had to dip into the savings account again, because we lost 35 speaking engagements in one weekend, 35 speaking engagements, canceled, 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 postponed, canceled, 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 postponed, I didn't travel again until August. So from March to August, I was unemployed, just at my house, hoping that God would pay my mortgage, because Jesus is my only single friend. And I would try to explain to him, I have a wife. I know you don't know nothing about that. I have a wife. I have a mortgage, Jesus, okay? The Holy Spirit challenged me. I'd been tithing my whole life, and the Holy Spirit said this. It's not even hard for you to tithe anymore. You've been doing it since you were 13. And if it doesn't require faith, then it doesn't please me. Because what? Faith pleases the Lord. This isn't even hard for you. So how about this? The Holy Spirit said, how much do you need every month? I said, just bare minimum. Just $5,000. It's the mortgage. That's the utilities. That's payroll for employees like Jayon who like do the graphics and do all you know do work for the ministry said I don't want to lay anybody off I, I, I want to do everything we need. I just need five thousand dollars the Holy Spirit challenged me then why haven't you given five hundred if what you need is five thousand dollars every month why haven't you sown five hundred because I am the God that will be faithful well get this I, me and my wife, we take a walk around the neighborhood, and I said to her, I got a crazy idea. She's like, you're a preacher. <laughs> you always have a crazy idea. And, you know, my test is if my wife shuts this down, it can't be from God. <laughs> so I'm assuming, you know, my wife's going to shut this down real quick. And my wife, I said, hey, I think that, you know, we need $5,000 every month. Let's put it on automatic recurring giving. You know it's real when it's on automatic. When you put it on automatic recurring giving, essentially what you're saying to the Lord is this is your problem. Now, if you let this money overdraft my account, then that's your problem. <laughs> so you need to make sure that there's enough money in there every single month so that you get your money, you know? So I set it to automatic recurring giving, $500 coming out at like the third of the month, every single month. So I get a call from a pastor in Phoenix, Arizona. I so get a call. And he says, hey, you know, we've been in lockdown because of the virus, you know, because of COVID-19. We've been, like, having church from home. We've been streaming. Hey, I, you know, you live about 15, 20 minutes from your church, right? I was like, yeah. He said, I just need you to drive 15, 20 minutes to your church, record a sermon, and just send it in. Send us the link for the sermon, and we will pay you every time we stream it. And, of course, I went, how many times are you streaming it? 
He said, well, we're going to stream it three times, and we're going to pay you $1,500 every time we stream it. I said, so you're telling me all I have to do, I don't have to fly anywhere. I just have to drive to my church, stand on stage, record a sermon, and you're going to pay me $1,500 every time you play it on YouTube. And he went, yep. Recorded all the sermons, and, and he sent us a check for $4,500. I went, oh, wow. We sold $500. Here's $4,500. But I'm a bit of a mathematician, so I was like, ah! We're short, $500, you know, but hey, God, I'm not going to complain. A week goes by. That pastor in Arizona had a best friend who lives in Houston. That friend called me and said, hey, I watched your sermon that you did at Pastor So-and-So's church. He said, how much did they pay you? I said, they paid me. $1,500 every time they streamed it. And, you know, so his words were, well, my church is bigger than his church. I'll pay you $2,000 every time we stream it. I said, how many times are you streaming it? He said, well, we're going to stream it three times. I was like, that's $6,000. One month I sold $500, got $4,500. The next month, I sold 500, got 6,000. Sold $1,000, got $10,000. Now, here's where the story gets interesting. I've got both checks in my hand. I'm driving to the bank to cash the checks, to deposit the check so we can pay the mortgage. mortgage. Just trying to pay the mortgage, all right? Holy Spirit says, that's not bread. That's seed. And I went, my single friend, Jesus. <laughs> My single friend, Jesus. Man, he says, that's not bread. You are not allowed to eat any of that. And the Holy Spirit asked me this question. Haven't I made sure your mortgage was paid every month before this? Keep obeying me. And I was like, all right, this is seed. What do you want me to do? And the Holy Spirit was really clear said, hey, you've been teaching people, you've been preaching to people for a long time. But I want you to, instead of preaching to people, I want you to teach them how to feed themselves. So I want you to go buy three cameras. I want you to convert your garage where you park your car into a full film studio. And I want you to hire people so that you can begin to teach Bible courses. And fast forward Two years, right now, ARMA, the ministry that we started in the middle of COVID, ARMA, it's Latin for armor, because we believe that every believer should have the armor of God in their life. And the armor of God includes the sword of the spirit. You should know how to use the Bible. You should know how to wield the sword of the spirit. We started a ministry called ARMA, A-R-M-A. And in, in June of 2020, we had no money. We had $10,000, and I was... I promise the Lord, I will not use this to pay my mortgage. I will not go on a date night. I will not spend this on anything. I will sow it. And today, Jayon, Jordan, Deborah, Sam, uh, Elijah, and Daniel all get bread called their direct deposit because I sowed seed two years ago. Right now, Arma is at a thousand subscribers that all pay about $20 a month to get Bible courses, and they get bread because I was faithful with seed. I refuse to get put in the bread line. Every single time money comes into your life, you need to ask a question. Is this bread or is this seed? What is this? And tithing is not the goal. I'm going to say something very uncomfortable. Tithing is not the goal. If you're arguing about tithing, you have missed the point. Let me say it this way. Had Jesus tithed his blood, we'd all still be going to hell. The goal is not to tithe. The goal is to live a sacrificial life. And for some, that may look like 20%. For some, that may look like 40%. What good is it if you're doing the number, but actually it's not even difficult for you? The question is not, did I, was I faithful with the 10%? The question is, was I faithful with the seed? Did I treat everything according to the category that God told me it was? Do I ask the Lord, 
God, do you want me to go above and beyond the 10% this month? Which of this is bread? Because the last thing I want to do is eat seed. Because what happens when I eat seed? I rob people of the bread that my life is supposed to produce. Arma right now has six employees. And they all get their direct deposit. Because I was faithful with seed. They get bread. Not only do they get bread in the form of finances, but there's a video I think we sent from a guy named Jesse Summers. You got that video? Awesome. There are people like Jesse that get the word of God delivered into their life because man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to show you this video from Jesse, and then we'll get into the rest of the message. Really taking Sunday sermons and devotionals and trying to apply them to my everyday life. I, I felt a little on my own anytime I cracked open the Bible. A big motivation for me was, was the women in ministry course. Just as that came out, my wife and I had just found out that we were having a daughter. And, you know, I've always thought like, I'm probably going to have a girl first and I want her to feel empowered, but I also want her to live a biblical lifestyle. But I never thought that those had to be like in opposition of each other. I not get Hi, baby. <laughs> Hi. You know, I, I am the spiritual leader of our home, but Arma's really given me the confidence to know that what I'm communicating to my family is biblical truth. We know that she's gonna grow up in church. She's gonna have awesome Sunday school teachers. She's gonna fall under great pastoral leadership, but we want her to know that the answers can be found at home. And I think for me personally, just knowing that I can be the father that and the husband that God has called me to be is priceless. It really is. You can text the word ARMA to 97000 and start a free trial. Like Jesse, Jesse's not a pastor. Jesse's not a minister. He's just a Christian that wants to be a good dad and a good husband. You know what, how being a good dad and a good husband starts? By knowing the word of God. And so I've got a really non-boring way to teach you the word of God. It's called ARMA. And uh, if you sign up, we got a free gift for you outside, okay? Uh, come on, let's keep going. Let's go to Genesis chapter 29. You, you ready? You good? Yeah. Come on, let's go to Genesis chapter 29. Uh, we're going to keep going in the story of Rachel and Leah. Come on, let's do a recap. Seed number one. Seed number two. Seed number three. Seed number four. Seed number five money if you would be a good steward over all five of those forms of seed there's no devil in hell that can stop you from being fruitful you will be a fruitful individual come on let's keep going genesis chapter 29 read this with me come on when the lord saw that was not he enabled her to conceive but rachel remained what Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Uh-oh. You hear the trauma in there? God has now given her a son. And her response is, I'm going to use this boy to try to get love from my husband. You would think after the first boy, she would learn her lesson, but she doesn't. Let's get to the next son. She conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. The core of her statement is still what? Hurt and pain and trauma. I'm not loved, therefore God gave me this one too. Names him Simeon. Verse 34, again she, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at my will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. 
Do you hear in Leah her desire to want to earn love? Her desire to want to use her children as a way to get Jacob to love her. And finally, she gets it right on boy number four. Here we go. She conceived a... And when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time, ooh, this time, this time I will, the Lord. So she named him what? Judah. Then she stopped having children. I'm going to take you to the book of Revelation. Come on, let's read this. Let's read this. Uh, Revelation 5, 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of, oh, the lion of the tribe of, of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll in its seven seals. I want to preach to you tonight this passage. This time I will praise. Oh, come on. This time I will praise. Oh, I did it for some wrong motives before. I wasn't healed before. But come on. This time I will praise. This time I will praise. I, I wonder, you know, because Jesus should have been the lion of the tribe of Reuben. But God can't work through Leah's pain and trauma and dysfunction. He should have been the lion of the tribe of Simeon. But Jesus is like, no, nope, can't work through that. Lion of the tribe of Leap, no. Nope. God got to wait for this woman to get her confession right. So that God can actually do what God wants to do. Can I ask you a question? Uh-oh. How many things have you named in your anger? How many things have you named in your pain? How often have your words been an overflow of your toxic heart? And you ended up naming something Reuben because you were hurt. Naming something Simeon because you were hurt. Naming something Levi because you were hurt. Can I, can I push us tonight that this time we will praise? That there is a Judah that you have yet to birth. There's a Judah that you've yet to release. There is a Judah. A praise that's released when you are frustrated. Oh, there we go. You can take that. This time, I will. This time, I will. Praise. praise. I love this because if you were to interview Rachel, say, hey, Rachel, how does it feel to be living your best life? Rachel would say, well, I don't have children. And you say, well, but your husband loves you. And she would say, yeah, but I don't have children. And if then you would put Leah to the side and say, hey, Leah, how does it feel to be living your best life? She would say, my husband doesn't love me. Get this. Rachel wants what Leah has. Leah wants what Rachel has. Can I tell you the secret to being content? Nobody has everything. Nobody has it all. And as long as you are Rachel looking at what Leah has, you will never praise the Lord. And as long as you are Leah looking at what Rachel has, you will never praise the Lord. Because your eyes are not focused on what God is doing in your life. Your eyes are focused on what God is doing in another person's life. You cannot covet what your neighbor has and properly praise God for what God has given you. Real praise is unlocked in your life when you declare and when you decide, I have everything I need to fulfill my purpose on this earth. I may not have what my sister has. I may not have what my brother has. I may not have what my friend at church has. But I have what I need to fulfill my unique call in the earth, to fulfill my unique assignment on this planet. Zach, years ago, if, before I was healed, I would have been so jealous of you because I wanted to be a PK so bad. I started preaching at 13. Ooh! And I, I had friends that were PKs. I wanted to be them so bad because their dads could teach them how to preach, you know what I mean? And I looked at their life, and PK means pastor's kid, preacher's kid. I wanted to be a PK. I, I wanted to be like Zach because my dad was not a pastor. He was on drugs. And finally, I remember going to a counseling session, and this therapist changed my life forever. 
the therapist, I was complaining about my father. I was saying my dad was manipulative with his words, could talk his way into anything, talk his way out of anything. Oh, man, my dad was toxic. And the counselor looked at me and said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. The therapist said, then it sounds like your father left you a powerful set of gifts. I said, oh, no, 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 I did not pay you to confront me or challenge me or offend me. My dad did not leave me with a powerful set of gifts. My father left me with baggage. My dad left me with issues. I got to now sit here with you. I was like, how about you put your little notepad away and listen to me vent about my trauma? The therapist said, can you describe your father to me one more time? I said, yep, my dad lied. My dad was hypnotizing with his words. My dad could do so much damage with his words. There are words that me and my mom heard my dad say that it took years for us to forget because not only did my dad take me to a crack house when I was five years old, but my dad embedded certain lies into my brain. And now I'm sitting here with a therapist and this therapist has the nerve to tell me that this man left me a powerful set of gifts. The therapist asked me a question one last time, said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. The therapist looked at me and said, sounds like you can talk your way out of anything. Sounds like you can talk your way into anything. Sounds like you're hypnotizing with your words. It sounds like your superpower is your words. You wanted a pastor to father you. But this man that does not even know God fathered you and did right by you. He blessed you. And that was the day that I realized I will praise God for everything that he's ever done in my life. I will never use my human perspective to dictate whether or not God deserves glory, God can use even the people who meant harm for me to bless me and who God has blessed. Nobody can curse. And when God opens a door, nobody can close it. God will use a drug addict to bless you. And I'm a testament of it. Before I was healed, I would have wanted to live Zach's life. Now I go, no, God gave me. Come on, what I needed. The moment you move from pitying to praise is the day that you realize God has done right by me. The abuse taught me a lesson. Oh, come on. The rejection taught me how to re re rely on God. Oh, come on. The lack? Oh, I'll praise God for the lack. You know why? I learned when I was unemployed that God was my provider. I learned it like I could have never learned it before. And as long as I'm looking at what Rachel has, I'll just complain. But the moment I say, oh, no, 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 I don't need what Rachel has. And Rachel doesn't need what I have. Everyone has exactly what they need, not what they want. Real praise is unlocked when we realize that God would never withhold anything that you need for life and godliness. It's funny. Um, Leah, she's awesome, and she's the not cute sister, and she's so strong emotionally, and she finally gets to the point of praise, but before that, on her journey, oh man, she keeps releasing things out of her mouth that she's going to have to live with, the seed of words, oh, she finally gets her confession right though, and I want to give you three forms of prayer that are not just petition, three forms of prayer tonight. Because often, it's actually sometimes the words that we release in prayer that end up doing harm, not good. And I'm gonna throw you a theological curveball tonight. Here we go. I battled with flight anxiety for a couple of years, which is torture because I'm on like two to three flights a week. Battling with flight anxiety when you travel as much as me is actually torture. And I remember doing really spiritual things before I boarded a flight. I'd lay hands on the plane. You know, I'd get on the plane, I'm just laying hands on the plane, you know. I command angels to surround this plane, and, you know, I'm doing really spiritual things. And then every time turbulence would hit, you know, turbulence would hit, and I would start praying, God, I rebuke turbulence. God, send your angels to make the plane fly steady. And one time I, I made friends with this guy at the gate right before we boarded the plane. And then we ended up sitting next to each other. He asked me what I did for a living. I always try to say something that's not pastor because people start acting weird around me. So I'm like, oh, I'm a speaker. <laughs> you know, and he's like, well, what do you speak about? 
I'm like, ah, I speak about Jesus, you know. And he's like, ah, I don't want to hear about none of that Jesus stuff. And I was like, hey, man, I had no plans on, on, on evangelizing to you. And then we're on this plane, turbulence hit, and, you know, you know, the plane just feels like a roller coaster. And immediately my palms get sweaty. I break out. I, get, I start feeling anxious. I feel sweat just start, like, uncontrollably releasing itself, like, from my pores. I mean, I'm, I'm antsy. And he looks over at me, and he says, aren't you a Christian? <laughs> He's cool as a cucumber. Looks over at me and says, aren't you a pastor? And he's like, hey, man, if this plane goes down, you're the one that's good. (laughs) And I remember thinking to myself, how dare I continue to live my life anxious when here is this uncircumcised Philistine, (laughs) cool as a cucumber. And here we go. I'm on the plane and every time children break out, I'm praying, God, God, I need you. God, send angels. God, and one day, here we go, this is gangster Jesus. While I'm praying, God goes, shut up. <laughs> shut up. You, have, you know the verse that says, a form of godliness but denies its power? All of that praying was a form of godliness, but there was nothing powerful in it. And this is what the Holy Spirit began to teach me. That every single time I pray, because I was anxious, you want to know who was listening to all those prayers? The enemy. And all I was doing was letting the enemy know how to push my buttons. I rebuke, I rebuke turbulence, and I I rebuke turbulence. And every time I rebuked turbulence, the enemy was like, oh, that's all I have to do. As long as there's turbulence, while he's going to a speaking engagement, I can make him ineffective by the time he gets to the speaking engagement. And I remember the Lord saying, hey, hey, buddy, shut up. So then I'm like, well, God, I was praying. (laughs) And God goes, but it wasn't effective. To which now I'm asking the question, then what's effective? And the Holy Spirit answers very clear. I've given you a tool. It's called speaking in tongues. Come on. I've given you a tool to pray so that the enemy does not know what you're saying. I've given you a tool that you can use at any point in time. Come on, okay, uh, has anybody ever seen any, uh, any movie from World War II? Come on, World War II movies are kind of my, some of my favorite movies, okay? There's this one movie called The Imitation Game. Anybody seen it? Benedict Cumberbatch, he's so handsome, anyway. Yep. And the allied forces are trying to crack the German code. Because if they can crack their code, then they'll know what they're going to do next. Because every enemy wants to crack the code of communication between the commanding officer and the soldier on the ground. Do you want to know what speaking in tongues is? It's a code that the enemy can't crack. So when you begin to pray out of all that anxiety and all that fear, all you're doing is letting the enemy know what you're battling with, what you're struggling with, and God begins to say, hey, 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 there's a perfect way to pray. And the perfect way to pray is to actually invite the Holy Spirit in so that you can begin to speak in tongues. I remember I was at a youth meeting, Pastor Zach, and uh, there's a youth meeting on on a Wednesday night, and my assistant youth pastor, we taught all of our youth leaders. Hey, when we do altar calls, we speak in tongues over people because it's a prayer language. First and foremost, speaking in tongues is a prayer language. We're at the altar, and my assistant youth pastor is just speaking in tongues over this student, just praying in tongues over this student. And after the youth meeting, the student says to my assistant youth pastor, how did you know about my stomach issue? And the youth leader goes, I don't know about your stomach issue. And he goes, no, 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 no. What? While we were at the altar, you were praying for my stomach issue. And the youth pastor immediately realized, well, I was speaking in tongues, and the Holy Spirit interpreted that tongues to this person that was receiving prayer. My assistant youth pastor then said, go to the doctor and find out if your stomach issue 
have them run tests. This kid goes to the doctor, runs tests, and he had actually had a rare form of stomach cancer, and at the altar, it got healed. Why? Because my youth pastor didn't need to interview him and ask him, well, what are you dealing with? No, all my youth pastor had to do is allow the Holy Spirit to intercede through him and pray for this student in the moment. The gift of tongues is so that you can pray for people and not have to be nosy and know all of their business. No, the Holy Ghost knows everything that's happening with an individual. And when you begin to release the power of the Holy Ghost as you pray for somebody, God can heal, God can deliver, God can set free, God can bring salvation into somebody's life just by you activating the gift of praying in tongues over somebody's life. Number one. Come on, we can clap for that. Come on. Speaking in tongues doesn't have to be spooky. Doesn't have to be weird. And here we go. A lot of times I do a prayer for people to come forward who want to receive the gift of speaking in tongues, and they're waiting for, like, God to take possession of their body. And I have to teach them, listen, the only thing that possesses people is the enemy. Demons possess. The Holy Ghost fills. And the Holy Ghost is not going to overpower your will. I'm not going to take control of your tongue and make you do something. No, no. No, the Holy Spirit does not possess. That's what demons do. The Holy Spirit fills. And man, the Holy Spirit fills you so that you can pray prayers that are not selfish, that are not full of fear, that are not full of anxiety. Come on, I need a bunch of humble Christians to admit you don't know how to pray right. Come on. How many times are you praying and the prayer is full of what you actually want God to do? You're like, Lord, I mean, do whatever you want, but really. <laughs> really do this. <laughs> as a daily practice, you should be praying in tongues in your own private life as a daily practice. Because what you would pray for yourself versus what the Holy Spirit would pray through you is totally different. And why? Why do we need the Holy Spirit to pray through us? Well, that's because God gave Adam authority on earth. God had to become a human to take back the authority that Adam gave the enemy. Therefore, God needs a human representative on the earth to what? Become a vessel to speak his will. When we speak in tongues, when we pray in tongues, what we're saying is that the Holy Spirit has an agenda. The Holy Spirit has full knowledge of what we need, and I'm giving my authority over to the Holy Spirit so that God's will can be done on earth. That is the gift of speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit speaking to anybody tonight. Two people. All right, come on. Number two, what's the second form of prayer? Second form of prayer, prophecy. Prophecy. I, I want to give you this passage from the book of Joshua. This is a good one. This is a good one. Uh, Joshua chapter 10, it says this. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to, Joshua said to the, who, who's he talking to? Which means this is what? Prayer. Joshua's talking to who? To who's Joshua talking to? Which means this is? Prayer, because talking to the Lord is prayer. What does Joshua say to the Lord? Sun stands still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. Whoa, wait a second. The Bible says that Joshua's talking to, and then he proceeds to address the problem in his life. Because here we go. Prayer is not just begging God for stuff. Prayer is speaking to every circumstance and demanding that it moves out of the way. Joshua says to the, and then doesn't say anything to the Lord. You, you see this, right? I don't know if you're catching this. You see this? Because this don't make no sense. J Joshua is praying to God, but only speaks to the issue. You want to know what prayer is? Speaking to cancer. I'll give you a good illustration. I was at church uh, a couple months ago. I was a couple years ago. And there was a mom on the second row. And uh, as the countdown video was playing, she looked at her kids, two boys, and she said, are y'all ready to go to children's ministry? 
and the kids like, yeah, you know, they threw a little tantrum. And they're like, no, we don't want to go. And then the mom, this is awesome, single mom, real gangster. She looked at the kids and she said, I'm sorry for confusing you by phrasing it as a question. <laughs> you are ready to go to children's ministry. You want to know what some of us need to say to depression? Sorry for confusing you by phrasing this like a question. Your days in my life are over. You know what we say to anxiety? Hey, I'm sorry for asking you to leave. No, your days in my life are just over. See, prophecy is when you speak to issues. I had to learn this with my dad because my dad would go on a drug binge and I would get really angry and I would get angry with him. Meanwhile, I realized, a pastor taught me, that I didn't need to be angry with my father. I needed to be angry with the spirit of addiction. And I remember one time, I looked him dead in his eyes and I said, spirit of addiction, be gone. And my dad's entire countenance began to change because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against powers and principalities and heavenly, uh, and heavenly forces in high places. And if you are distracted by the flesh and blood issue in front of you, I need you to read Joshua because this is prayer. And Joshua speaks to the sun and he speaks to the moon and he commands forces to change, to align with God's will for his life. Can I ask you a question? Are you just begging God for stuff? Or are you using the authority that God has placed in your tongue to begin to prophesy your future into existence? The last form of prayer, last form of prayer is praise. Praise. Simple. God, thank you. But I didn't do anything yet. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Praise before God does anything is an act of faith. I don't need you to do anything because you're not my genie. You're my God. I thank you for who you are. I thank you. We can get keys playing because everything sounds more spiritual when there's keys playing. Come on, the first one of prayer is speaking in tongues. Second form of prayer is prophecy. Third form of prayer, praise. Praise. Can I ask you a hard question? If you look at your prayer life, how much of it is petition versus tongues, prophecy, and thanksgiving? How much of your prayer life is God, that's me again, asking you for the same thing I already asked you for? And prayer is boring for you? Come on. And you don't get... You don't get far in your prayer life, and you don't get a lot of prayers answered, and you're discouraged in prayer. Come on, can we be honest tonight? Like, man, when you think prayer, you just, oh, you, you know, you're not, you're, you don't get good thoughts. Well, could it be that we learned somewhere in church that the dominant form of prayer that we should be practicing is petitioning? God, can you? God, please. God, will you do it? God, we release you. God, 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 God. And God says to, him, to you, whoa, hey, I've given you authority. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In that circumstance, you don't need to keep begging me about it. You need to start speaking in tongues about that. You need to start speaking it into existence. People thought I was crazy. Because I kept saying I was going to have a kid soon. And then they'd get all confused. And they'd say, wait, is your wife pregnant? And I went, not technically. And I would let them know. I'd say, well, you know, Jesus said he was coming back soon. And it's been 2,000 years, so. <laughs> I'm totally okay with confusing you. But I'm going to. Speak this into existence. I'm going to speak the world that I want to see into existence. I'm going to speak in tongues more than I speak in English. Hello. I'm going to prophesy to every mountain. A lot of us spend a lot of time in prayer telling God how big our mountain is. But you want to know the true secret of prayer? It's telling your mountain how awesome your God is. I'm, I'm going to praise. 
I'm going to throw a praise party. And every single time the enemy attacks me, I'm going to confuse the enemy with how ecstatic I am about the presence of God. So I started doing three things. Number one, every time I was on an airplane and turbulence broke out, first thing I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And why was I saying thank you? I was saying thank you for this. Thank you, Lord, for giving me an opportunity to overcome this anxiety. Because a good father doesn't rescue their kids from every trial. A good father has to practice self-control and restraint. Because if you rescue too much, you'll form weakness in that kid. A good father wants you to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So a good father will let the turbulence happen. Why? Because if he keeps rescuing you from turbulence, you'll never learn how to have peace in the middle of chaos. God says, the circumstances don't have to be peaceful for you to have peace. Everything around you can be falling apart. Peace happens on the inside. God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're choosing something for me that I would not have chosen for myself. Thank you. Next, I start speaking in tongues. I start speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, whispering in tongues, and then I start prophesying. I'm going to land. I'm going to land safely, and I'm going to preach effectively. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to get picked up from the airport, and I'm going to preach an effective message tonight, and nothing is going to come in the way of me delivering God's message. I would get off of flights. My stomach would be in knots. Then I started getting real bold. Every time turbulence would break out, I would just recline the seat. To prove to the enemy, this is not an area of my life where I'm going to let you have authority. No way. Because if I give you an inch today, you'll take a mile tomorrow. The enemy loves to play these little games with us. Where he convinces us that it's not that serious. Oh, it's just a little anxiety. It's not that serious. I don't know if you've ever read the children's book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. It is that serious. You know why? Because if the enemy can get you to give over your peace, the next, he'll want your joy. If you, give, if you let him have your joy, the next thing you know, he's taking the vision that God has given you for your life. If you let him, have, then he'll want your purpose. Then he wants to get into your finances. Then he'll want your health. He does not, he cannot be reasoned with. No peace treaties with the enemy. All out war. No, you will not have my mind. No, you will not have my peace. No, you will not have my joy. No, you will not have my thought process. No, you will not have anything pertaining to me. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my future. You will not have my church. No, you will not have my grandchildren. No, you will not put your hands on anything related to me. I create a force field of faith around me. You will not have anything in my life. And I will praise God. I'll speak in tongues and I will prophesy. If you're in the room, come on, the, the worship team can come out. If you're in the room and you're saying, man, I've been complaining a lot. Come on, I've been using my words to complain about all the stuff in my life. And like Leah, I need to become a, someone who praises. Like I, I need to begin to praise God for all the uncomfortable things. I need to praise him for all the stuff that I'm actually not happy about come on if that's you we're going to enter into a time of worship can I tell you something praise is in direct rebellion to your flesh praise is in direct rebellion to your feelings and to your flesh because you cannot praise if your eyes are fixed on the wrong thing I'm not focused on what you're doing in Rachel's life no, no, no. I've decided that this time I will praise the Lord. If you're in the room and you're saying, man, Pastor Manny, you're preaching to me. I need to, I need to enter into another realm of praise where it's not just what happens 
in here on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, but I'm going to wake up with a praise on my lips because I've got to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and enter into his gates with praise. I've got to become someone who is intentional about releasing praise because God is awesome and he's good and he deserves it. Come on, if that's you, wave at me. Wave at me, wave at me, wave at me. Come on, then, as an act of faith, just go ahead. Stand up right where you are. Come on. I call church praise practice. Because guess what? This isn't the game. It's just practice. This is practice for the muscles that you're going to have to use. Tomorrow when that coworker who's contentious, when your spouse who's Come on, not as sanctified as you begins to get on your nerves and you've got to go, God, I praise you. Because for some of us, we are living in the prayers that we used to ask God for. And now the very answer to the prayer that you asked for is something that you're frustrated about. And you've got to decide, no, I'm going to praise. I'll praise you for my kids. I'll praise you for my spouse. I'll praise you for this job. I'll praise you for the thorn in my flesh. I'll praise you for the sickness because I'll praise you for the healing late. I'll praise you. I'm just going to praise Maybe you're in the room and you're saying, Pastor Manny, I need to begin to prophesy to some circumstances in my life. Like that single mom, I've confused the enemy by asking him to leave. And come on, wave at me. If you're saying, no, not anymore. I'm going to take my prayer life to the next level by speaking things into existence. And then come on, if you're in the room and you're saying, praying in tongues needs to become normal habit in my life. Come on, if that's you. If that's you, speaking in tongues is not spooky, it's not weird. Let me teach. Come on, we're going to worship, and I'm going to lay hands on people at the altar. And I believe that there are people in the room tonight who are going to speak in tongues for the first time, or for the first time in a long time. We're Pentecostal. We believe that that the gift of tongues is available for every believer, that you can walk in the fullness of every gift that God has for you. For my birthday, people love to give me gift cards. And uh, one time I got this gift card for my birthday. I went to the store to use it and uh, swiped the gift card and it didn't work. It, didn't de- it got declined. And uh, the guy behind the register said, hey, did you activate that? And I went, no. He's like, hey, there's instructions, bro. Read the instructions. You got to activate the gift card. And I activated the gift card. It worked just fine. I need you to see this. The gift card was in my possession. It was mine but it wasn't activated. The Holy Spirit has already filled you. The Bible says that you can't even confess Jesus as Lord without what? The Holy Spirit. You wanna know what we wanna do tonight as you come down to the altar? We wanna activate the gifts of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. We wanna activate, we're not begging the Holy Spirit to come in and we're not believing that the Holy Spirit is gonna possess us, no. We're simply saying, Holy Spirit, I want what is dormant within me to become tonight I want what is been dormant in my life to become active come on if you're in the room and you're like man I'm putting a I'm putting a line in the sand I'm gonna praise God for all the scenarios in my life that are good bad ugly and everything in the middle come on make your way down here come on get down to the altar get down to the altar get down to the altar come on we want to consecrate There's nothing spooky or weird about the altar. We just want to come forward. Come on, lift up your hands. And we're going to enter into a time of praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.